You might wonder why we're even having this session on finance, on the fundamentals of finance. We don't have any uh, cases in this course that are very finance oriented. So in that sense, it's not directly relevant. And with a few exceptions, we have a central banker here. But most of you do not work directly in the financial sector. And my guess is that most of you, given your background and your professional interests, are a little bit intimidated by finance, thinking that it's very full of numbers and calculations, uh, and therefore it's an easy subject to ignore. And what I'd like to do today is to show you, number one, that you don't have to use a lot of numbers uh, and calculations to understand finance. But more importantly, I would make the statement that regardless of your professional interest and career, it is critically important that you have at least a rudimentary knowledge of how the financial sector works. Why? Because whether you're a government official, whether you're interested in social impact, whether you're in an NGO, uh, whether you're in the Department of Commerce, I don't care where you work in the public sector, I believe it's imperative, and I'm going to try and convince you in the next few minutes, that it's very important that you have a basic understanding of how financial markets and institutions function because it's directly related to, or indirectly related to the work you do. I also think there's a misconception that when we talk about finance, we're talking about the private sector. And it's about business. And that finance is really about business and financial institutions. And that also is a misconception. Uh, the largest user of financial markets private financial markets, capital markets, and the largest user of private financial institutions, private banks and other institutions, are governments in every single country. They raise more capital in the private marketplace than any private company or bank. So it's very important in government to understand how financial markets and institutions work, I think. And I'm going to try and make that case today. I'm going to try to demonstrate that it's pretty easy, believe it or not, to understand the basics um, of finance. And so we're going to go through this. But it's easy to understand it. But the other message that's going to come out in the next few minutes is that it is an extremely difficult sector to regulate and oversee relative to other parts of the private sector. And we'll talk about that. The second reason we're talking about this, this is a course about public policy, private sector development, and as Marcos was just talking about, economic development. <coughs> reducing inequality, reducing poverty, growing economies. And the second message of this presentation is that that those objectives, those national objectives, are directly connected to how well or not the financial sector functions. If the financial sector functions well, countries grow, poverty is reduced, inequality is reduced, and the opposite. And I'd like to demonstrate that today. So let me just tell you what the basic agenda uh, is. First, we're going to very, very quickly and very simply sh define what we mean by the financial sector. It's, pretty, it's not too difficult to understand what we mean by the financial sector. Uh, but then, and more interestingly, I think, we want to talk a little bit about why, when we talk about finance and the financial sector, we're talking about a part of a market economy that is fundamentally different than any other private sector activity in a market economy for very specific reasons. And I'll give you a hint to what it, the, re, the main difference is that in finance, the public welfare, every one of us in this room and the public welfare more generally is directly affected by the performance of finance. That makes it different than other private sector activities. And I think we have to understand that a little bit. Because it's different, because it affects the, the public welfare, there are various theories 
and ideologies like Marcus, Marcus was talking about, about how to oversee and monitor financial sector activity. If it affects the public welfare so profoundly and everybody in the society, we have to oversee it. But there are tremendous differences of opinion, tremendous debates about how to do, do that effect, effectively. And the reason there are these differences is because uh, it, the financial sector has certain specific characteristics that make it extremely vulnerable to crisis and extremely difficult to regulate and monitor by public officials. There's something different about finance compared to other parts of the private sector that create tremendous challenges for public officials. It's not easy. Indeed, there is no perfection when you talk about overseeing and perfecting uh, the, the financial sector. That is why if you read the commentators, you read the pundits, you read the academics, financial crises are almost inevitable. Not all the time, not always, as, uh, not all, always with the same severity, but financial crises recur. Always, no matter how hard we try to control what happens in the financial sector, there are recurring financial crises that affect all of us, not just the people involved. And that is for very specific reasons, which I think we should try and understand, and why it is so tough for people like Jose, who's in the central bank, to create policies that are going to reduce the damage, mitigate the risks of financial crisis. And I think we can understand this morning a little bit about that. So that's the first part of this palestra, this, this lecture. The second part is, has to do with economic development. And what I'd like to do very briefly and very simply is make this connection between the performance of the financial sector and economic development. In any country, including Brazil, of course, if the financial sector works reasonably well and does certain things reasonably well, you're going to generate, you're going to be, a, it's a catalyst for growth and development, and the opposite. And, and understanding that connection, that linkage, I think is very, very important. So let's try and get through this agenda in a reasonable period of time. What is the financial sector? Very simple. It, uh, as I at least prefer to define it. And I think that you can identify with this. And that basically it is the interconnection between three sets of institutions. All three together and how they interrelate define what we call the financial sector. And so we have the institutions, and you're familiar with some of them and not others, but we have private institutions such as banks, private banks, uh, brokerage firms, int uh, insurance companies, and so forth. The private financial institutions that are intermediaries in the financial sector. But we also have financial institutions that are public, like the central bank, uh, and, and, and that are also critically important. So the financial institutions, both public and private, are one part of the financial sector. Uh, and then there are the, pub the policies that govern the financial markets and the financial institutions. And here I've given you a few basic examples. You don't have to understand all of them, but the, wh whether those financial policies work or don't work are critically important, and they are meant to govern the behavior of the markets and the institutions that we're talking about. And the third component of this are the markets themselves, the financial markets. And those could be a combination of domestic financial markets, stock markets, bond markets, private, mar private financial markets, and of course, international financial markets. And we used to talk about them as being distinct. Today, with globalization, they're totally interconnected. So it's very hard to differentiate between domestic financial markets and international financial markets. But you, you see that they're all interconnected. And the, th the combination of these three sets of institutions, markets, financial institutions, and financial policies, comprise what we would call the financial sector. Now, a basic question that we never stop to ask, but is critically important to understanding finance generally, is where does the money come from? 
in the financial sector, and where does it go to, and how does it get there? Where does the money come from? How does it, where does it go to, and how does it get there? And so a very basic way of looking at this is what we call the sources and uses of funds. And this is, should be very familiar to everybody, uh, although there's some interesting aspects to this. So where does the money come from? It's, 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 it's basic logic. You don't have to be an expert to understand. So it's people like you and me are our savings and the savings of companies, uh, excess retained earnings of companies and banks, and of course, governments. All of these are, have at one time or another excess funds, what we will call savings. Even if there's a deficit, every one of you probably has a credit card. But at the same time, you have savings. Every one of you has some savings. And so what do you do with those savings? You put them in some type of a financial intermediary for safekeeping or for investment. So we have these different types of financial intermediaries that are very important. And maybe you may just simply deposit your savings in a bank. You may invest it in a mutual fund. Uh, you may put it in your pension, that's a form of savings. You may have an insurance plan, that's a form of savings. Or you may take your savings and rather than go through a financial intermediary, such as a bank, you may invest those savings directly into the marketplace, the financial markets, by purchasing a bond or purchasing a stock. So you're intermediating your savings in one form or another through these institutions to the, to the ultimate users. It doesn't just sit in those institutions, those intermediaries, it is used. And guess what? Look who uses it. The same people who have saved. So everyone on the, on the left who is a saver, you, companies, governments, are also users. So you have savings and you also borrow. You have a credit card, you have a mortgage. If you have a small business, you borrow money for your business. And so that is the flow of funds through the financial sector. From the sources, the, the savers, through intermediaries, to the users, and in every country, to one extent or another, everyone, ironically, is both a saver and a user of financial markets. And so this is, this is how the market works. Now, what we're saying here is that, I don't want to spend much time on this, but what I've just described is what we call in finance, and this couldn't be more simple, is the process of financial intermediation. The process of getting savings of different types from different types of institutions from the savers through institutions to productive use. When the financial system works well, the financial se sector works well, the textbook will tell you that what we are doing is we are mobilizing savings, intermediating it through good financial institutions, and it ends up in productive investment that is going to help the economy grow and give different users access to those, those savings at reasonable cost. Sounds very, very simple, and in practice, it's very, very complicated. And we don't have to go through all this, but that financial intermediation process is very, very important. And by, when you do it correctly, you're creating you're facilitating liquidity, the ease of buying and selling. You're, the, you're facilitating how securities are traded and so forth. Uh, but the basic point is that the financial intermediation, how, if it's efficient, it's going to lead through the system into productive investment that's going to help, help the economy. Uh, in most countries, uh, however, there are tremendous impediments that keep this from happening the way the textbook tells us uh, it, it should happen. 
And, and so there is a very, very wide gap in reality in almost all developing countries, including, excuse me, Brazil, between theory and reality. And the financial sector does not work as well as we would like it to for very, very specific reasons. So I want to, with that background, now you know a little bit about finance and how the financial sector works. That's all you have to know. But there are three premises that I want to, I want to, I want to discuss. Uh, the first is that finance and the financial sector is different than any other private sector activity. Automobiles, computers, <coughs> agriculture. Think of any other private sector activity in a market economy and the first premise is finance is different. And the main reason why it's different, not the only reason, unlike if you're in the computer industry or you're in the automobile industry or in the agribusiness industry, if a company fails, it has disastrous consequences for the employees of that company, for the customers of that company, for the shareholders and creditors of that company, but that's it. In finance, if, a, if a, financial, a large financial institution fails, it has far-reaching consequences for the, for, for the whole sector and for the public welfare. And we learn this every time we have a crisis. And I'll come back to that and explain why those consequences are so far-reaching. So it's much more interconnected with everything that happens in the country and with every individual in the country than any other part of the private sector. And therefore, we care. And we have to pay special uh, at attention to it. And it also is, se the second premise is that there are specific reasons why there is this interconnection between private financial activity and public welfare. And I want to spend a couple of minutes explaining what that connection is, which makes the financial sector different than other private sector activities. And the third premise is that there are certain characteristics about finance that make it a nightmare for regulators compared to other private sector activities. It's always difficult. We've talked about this in the course, that it is always difficult to regulate. There's limited government capacity. There is limited uh, human capital to do what it's supposed to do. And we've talked a lot about the limits of government capacity to do what it says it's going to do. But there is something special about finance and the financial sector that makes it more difficult, more challenging, than, it, than, than overseeing, monitoring, governing any other private sector activity in a market economy. That's a very strong statement, but it's very easy, I think, to demonstrate. So why is it different? Uh, I said it was more important for public welfare than any other private sector activity. Why? Because every financial institution that takes your savings is a fiduciary with a public responsibility to safeguard your money. And everybody uses those financial intermediaries. Not everybody buys a car. Not everybody uh, buys a computer in a, in, in a country. But virtually everybody uses the financial sector. And so there are public welfare consequences when those private financial institutions take your savings in, of everybody and they perform poorly. It's, it, it goes far beyond what happens to that financial institution itself. And because of that, because of that, that is the rationale for why it is so important for governments to regulate banks and to regulate them more carefully and have a heavier hand than maybe in the automobile industry or the computer industry or the agribusiness industry because all of us are affected. So we just cannot, as government officials, ignore the performance, the behavior, 
of these private financial institutions. They're too important for all of us, not just for themselves or their shareholders. Secondly, it's important because compared to any other private sector activity, they're vulnerable to crisis for specific reasons. So if Ford Motor Company fails, as I said before, it's very bad for the employees, it's very bad for the customers, it's very bad for the shareholders and creditors. It's not that bad for, for society. There are other automobile companies. We're, we feel sorry for all these people, but it does not undermine what's happening in a larger sense for the society. It doesn't have broader public welfare consequences. If Citibank or Itaú or Deutsche Bank fails, it has far-reaching consequences for the rest of the financial sector and therefore for all of us. Why? Because all of these financial institutions are interconnected. And by that, I mean that they are always borrowing and lending to each other as well as us on a daily basis. So if Citibank, which has financial relationships, borrowing and lending relationships with more than 3,000 other banks around the world, if Citibank from day one to day two fails, goes bankrupt, all those 3,000 institutions are affected. This is the system, what we call the systemic nature of finance that is distinct compared to other parts of the private sector. There's nothing systemic about Ford Motor Company. There's nothing systemic, maybe a little bit, about Microsoft, but not much. But in the financial sector, because of this interconnectivity, this financial interconnectivity, when one large financial institution fails, it reverberates throughout the financial sector and you have a financial crisis. This is what happened in 2008, 2009. Lehman Brothers went, 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 went bankrupt from one day to the next and it had financial relationships with thousands of other financial institutions around the world that were now not gonna get paid. And this got, and this, this, this uh, multiplied. And that's how financial crises begin. So it is the systemic nature of finance that is unique and makes it so vulnerable to crisis. One financial institution if it fails, if it underperforms, if it misbehaves, can have far-reaching consequences for the whole sector and therefore for public welfare more generally. And we must care as a government when that happens. And this, these two factors together, the fact that they are systemic uh, and, and the fact that they are so important for public welfare, those two factors give you the rationale, the justification for why the government must intervene and protect against this failure, because we're all affected. So the government for, tends to be very interventionist in banks. It has very heavy regulations of banks, much more than in other parts of the private sector, arguably. But this is the reason why. And so, for example, in most countries, we have deposit insurance to protect you, the savers, in the event that a bank fails. It's a form of protection that you wouldn't give in other parts of the private sector. But we, don't want, we as, as, as public servants, don't want these banks to fail because of the consequences for public welfare. Uh, so it's, a, it's different. It's very different than other private sector activities in a market economy for these three interconnected reasons. So what do you do about it? Well, this, this is where it gets very, very tough. And there's a tremendous ongoing debate, both practical and intellectual, about how you do this. And there are, I've reduced this to two points of view. 